You know what I've been thinking about? And I think, I don't know, maybe you guys have picked up on this too. Who knows? How long did it take a body to get dusty? You know, a wooden cabinet, a bookshelf, you gotta dust that shit every week. Bones get dusty. But bodies, we typically think of them as decomposing. Maggots get in them and they're, I guess the meat's always moving. But how long would a body have to stay completely still before decomposition sets in and becomes bones to collect dust? I mean, there isn't a lot of movement in the podcasting game, so if anyone's going to crack that enigma, it'll probably be someone in this racket. But, I don't know, maybe you guys have the answer. Someone knows that, you should DM me. Yeah, definitely DM me or email me or something. I want to know. I'm curious. I feel like there's an answer out there. What the hell this has to do with anything? I don't know. But this is episode two. The Deuce. I'm Tommy Thompson, and this is Dirty History a podcast dedicated to those pieces of the past that are routinely overlooked by educators and academics alike. So last week we left off, and I'm going to take an editorial here, swimming down the most disgusting river in America. We followed the filth and plugged our noses, and like Upton Sinclair, we ended up at the gates of Union Stockyards. This week, we're going to go inside those gates, and we're going to check out the Union Stockyards, see what they're all about, But first, I think we need to contextualize our study a little bit. Give a little bit of background. I know last episode we did a lot, but I think we need a little bit more about the industry itself and not so much the city it's in. So from the point where meatpacking becomes an industrial kind of chore, Cincinnati is the big city. By 1840, Cincinnati led all other cities in pork production. It proclaimed itself Porkopolis. If your city's biggest claim to fame is the fact that you're called Porkopolis, I think you have bigger problems than the pollution caused by being Porkopolis. I'd love to freaking live in Porkopolis. Porkopolis. Sorry. You have Superman and Metropolis. Do you imagine the kind of superheroes they have in Porkopolis? Porkopolis? I can't say this word. Could you imagine the kind of superheroes they probably had in Porkopolis? That's something to think about, though, for sure. Anyway, well into the Civil War and around the 1860s, Chicago becomes the country's largest meatpacking center. It surpasses Cincinnati and becomes number one. Woohoo! Number one meatpacking city in the world. And they get that from uh, railroad accessibility, you know, to the big centers. They also have um, a good railroad connection to the heartland where all of the cattle's being raised. So they have the connections. And they get a lot of Union Army contracts for uh, food for the soldiers in the Civil War. So thus the city, the city grows. In 1906, The Jungle's published. But prior to that, Sinclair spends several months researching the packing houses. He goes undercover. So we're going we're gonna to place this episode in that period in which Sinclair was plausibly researching. You could say he's researching 1904 to 1905, but I don't want to do just two years, so I'm going to do a five-year span. We're going to place this episode at the height of Chicago's powers, 1900 to 1905. By 1900, Chicago employed 25,000 of the 68,000 packing house employees in the United States. That's 25,000 men, women, and children working in the packing houses. That number is one-fifth of Chicago's population. One-fifth. And that's an interesting number, I think, an interesting uh, fraction to juxtapose against the one-tenth of the population, if you remember from last week, that died in 1885 from typhoid and cholera that could plausibly be traced back to the packing houses. How do you deal with that? You know, how do you analyze the cost-benefit analysis? One-fifth rely on it for work, one-tenth died plausibly because of it. What do the people in Chicago, how how do they deal with it, you know? What is the 
public reaction prior to the jungle? Well, for one, they employed the handy title for the city, Hog Butcher of the World. Mm. That's not... Their title is Hog Butcher of the World, so that's not quite as catchy as Porkopolis. Not quite as catchy as Porkopolis, but it, it doesn't really even have a ring to it. It's just kind of a sad title that you give to your city when you have nothing else going for it. Hog Butcher of the World. So they don't just give themselves a uncatchy title. They uh they also tour the slaughterhouses. And these are extremely popular, these slaughterhouse tours. I mean, if you go to the height in 1900, some 500,000 people are visiting the slaughterhouses every year. So that's an interesting way to figure how they dealt with it. They dealt with the slaughterhouses by doing what I think is a very, very human thing to do. They didn't deal with it at all. I mean, yeah, the city pushed them out of the city limits, but people still smelled it. They still dumped the shit in the river. So they didn't really deal with any of the problems. And you're probably wondering, okay, well, how did they view these tours? Were they disgusted by it? No. They weren't disgusted by it. They were amazed by the modernity of human efficiency. They thought it was amazing how mechanically efficient it was to kill hundreds of animals every hour. So thinking about that, I was I was curious what these kind of tours, what these tours would look like. So I thought the best way to explore these slaughterhouses as Sinclair would have seen them would be to take these one of these tours and we would glean a interesting perspective from them. The jungle places you inside the mind of a worker. I want to place you in an objective view of the slaughterhouse with no axe to grind for you to make your own judgment. And that's where I think the jungle comes short. It puts you in the shoes of a worker. So obviously you're going to have a, a bias. And you can argue everything has a bias, and that's true. But this one has a clear anti-packing house bias. And not for what it is doing, but for the working conditions it presents if that makes any sense. So, I'm going to show you what the day-to-day -day is like above a slaughterhouse. You're going to see the work done in a cold and efficient manner. And that in itself has its own bias, but I think it's an interesting perspective that hasn't been taken frequently. So at the beginning, these tours were given by street kids. And when I say street kids, I picture a little a little dude in a page boy hat. Follow me, sir. Come on down this... <coughs> I'm really sick, sir. No mind. This is going to be fun. <coughs> I don't know why he's British, but that's the best way I could do a sick boy. They all had that cough, you know? I don't know what the hell that cough is, but they all had it. Well, anyway, these packing houses, they get wise, and they organize their own tours, and they hire their own guides that aren't little kids in page boy hats. So you get to the stockyards, and you enter through this magnificent gate. And if you uh, read at all Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, um, you learn the guy who behind the gate, you know, Burnham and Root, a couple of uh, very, uh, very important architects in our history, but that's another episode altogether. You pass through the Union stockyard gates, and you, you enter a waiting room. It's well lit, there's artwork on the walls, there's windows... And your guide greets you. He's well-to-do enough. His speech is proper. He's clean-shaven. And the clock strikes the start time, and you're led to a gallery above the killing floors. You can see everything. It was a family affair, you know. You took your kids to see these things. And when I say it showed you and your family everything, you saw most every part of the operation, except for the fertilizer room, which we'll explain why in a little bit. And at the end of this tour, you thank them for it. You thank them for the tour because you were, you were in awe of the mechanical efficiency of the slaughter of all of these animals. Sinclair was not that impressed. He compares it to a river of death because the flow of animals was continuous. 
he takes a much more organic view. He mixes the natural and the unnatural for an offsetting kind of tone, where the common person takes it and puts it in mechanical terms, something they can understand. Well, at this point, you're in the hog room, and the hogs are strung up by their hind legs by chains, and they're led by a pulley system to a man in a blood-splattered apron who slits their throats. And they scream like people, you know. Hogs do. They're launching themselves back and forth, trying to get free of the chains. Their squeals are choked by their own blood. They're screaming. The guide would say something like, They have about 250 miles of track within the odds. They'll bring 10,000 heads of cattle a day, as many hogs and half as many sheep. And let me tell you, they don't waste anything here. No, Sue, they use everything about the hog except the squeal. That's funny, isn't it? My wife doesn't love me. The tour guide would continue, and, and that sound, I mean, that really had to be something, you know. Thousands of pigs clinging to life. Sinclair touches on it, saying, quote, there were high squeals and low squeals, grunts and wails of agony. There would come a momentary law and then a fresh outburst, louder than ever, surging up to a deafening climax, unquote. Then the animals were dunked into a huge vat of boiling water. Many animals survived the throat-slitting process long enough to experience being dunked into a huge vat of boiling water. They were boiled alive in many cases. And the boiling process was to, uh, was to loosen the bristles and the skin so it'd be easier to rip and pull. So the animal comes out of its dunk tank and its, uh, its bristles of hair are removed. Someone with a, like a big, um, just kind of plucking them out, you know, really quick. Two men would take a knife, remove a leg. Another two would precisely cut and sever the head. And the animal's pieced apart. And it gets bloody, too. I mean... They're not completely bled at this point, and uh, there was a guy, a couple of guys, we'll say, that had not mops, but sort of squeegees, and they're, they're, they're pushing the blood on the floor into these holes in the ground that drain into the river, of course. But it would still get, it would still get slippery, and guys are running around with knives on slippery floors, and so there were a lot of accidental cuts and amputations, stabbings. All accidental, of course, because men are slipping around on the blood, and next thing you know, someone's on the floor with a slice in their leg, and their blood's getting in with the pig's blood, and pig's blood's getting in their leg, and then the floor hasn't been washed in three days. <laughs> I'm kidding. The floor hasn't been washed ever. And next thing you know, they have blood poisoning in their leg. It gets gangrenous. they got to cut it off. You know, it's... Who knows what could happen? There are so many accounts that touch on the brutality of working on the floor. So one can only imagine, with such little care taken to the human element, the care that is ignored altogether for the meat. I mean, after it's pieced apart, the butchered up pieces of the animal would reach an inspector, but it was a visual inspection if it was inspected at all. The inspector would usually sit there and smoke his cigars, butts all around him on the floor, and Sinclair and a lot of newspapers and other writers talk on how the inspector was a very talkative fella, usually. If someone came around on a tour, he would be more than happy to lend himself to a conversation with just hundreds of cuts passing him by, going completely uninspected. So the meat wasn't very well inspected, we'll put it that way. I mean, an invisual, a visual inspection can only touch on so many things. And if the visual inspection did pick up on anything, any meat that he deemed unfit, it wasn't pulled from, produ from production. No, the meat just wasn't allowed to leave city limits. Which meant that people still ate the rancid or rotten or diseased meat, it just had to be within the city limits of Chicago. So that meant the people, specifically poor people, like the meatpacking workers themselves, would get the worst and most putrid cuts of inspected meat if it was inspected at all. So disease ran rampant in the lower classes, largely due to diseased meat. But let's not fool ourselves and say disease wasn't rampant everywhere, because 
a lot of meat that's diseased can't be picked up on with a visual inspection. He just looked at the meat and said, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's not good, it's green. All right, give it to the poor people. Post-inspection, the hog parts would be frozen for about 24 hours. And then what's left of the hog, which is usually the intestines, they're scooped out and scraped. Scooped out meant it's pulled from the body. Scraped means the intestines were cleaned out. So someone's job was to clean out the inside of the intestines. So that's partially digested food, which we call vomit, and waste, which we call shit. Think about the smell in that room. You were working with a decomposing animal full of vomit and shit. That's your job. So these scraped out intestines were now to be made into sausage casings. They weren't cleaned specifically, they were just scraped out. And they were, they were fit at that point for casing. Bones and bristles made combs, and then the rest of the animal was melted down. They turned that into margarine, fertilizer, glycerin, ammonia, gelatin. These were the rendering plants. This is where they took a big vat, boiled down all the excess parts, and the grease was scraped off the top, and that made margarine, soap, lard. And then at the very bottom of the tank, there was like this jelly kind of substance that was scraped and used to make gelatin. They still do this today. I bet you love your Mike and Ikes. And then everything that wasn't used was just dumped into the river. And that's pretty much a sum up of the hog plant. So you get through the hog plant and the guide would say something like, We're going to cut over to the cattle plant now. Aha, cut over, cattle, get it? It's quite a spectacle over there. We have knockers, cleaver men, headsmen, flawsmen, tankers, picklers, canners, packers, salters, amusements to amaze and bewilder. I am so alone. And this was common. By 1900, beef became big. Pork used to be the main form of meat that was harvested, but now beef has made a big come up. By 1900, the beef plant is as big as the pork plant, and they employ a lot of workers over there. I think we need to get a couple of definitions. The guide gave us quite a few terms. There were knockers. They had huge sledgehammers, big burly guys, and they would crush the skull of the cattle to kill it. They had the cleaver men. They had blades about two feet long, again, big burly guys, and they would cut whole sides of beef or pork. And they would bisect the animal. Then there were the floors men. There was quite a few of these guys. They would skin the animal and then rip it away. I don't know why they were called, they weren't called skinners. That would make more sense instead of floorsmen, but hey, what the hell do I know? There were the headsmen. They severed the cattle's head with two strokes. It said they were very specific about that. Two strokes with a knife, and they were able to sever the head. Then came the tankers. They worked in the tank rooms, which boiled down the excess parts that were pumped out to make lard. The picklers who worked in the pickle room, the salters who worked in the salt room, the canners who worked in the canning room, and the packers who worked in the packing room. And that's the thing about each one of these guys doing different jobs. They all had their own specific ailment. You know, they all had their own specific disease that was very, very job and task specified. I mean, for the... I mean, let's just go down the list. Knockers often, they threw out their backs. I mean, it was a very strenuous job, and they only lasted about a year. Cleaver men had much the same problem, except they would also have uh, a lot of amputations in the cleaver man's job. Involuntary amputations. Same with the floors men that were cutting skin and ripping it away. Where a cleaver man might lose a hand, floors men would lose a finger, might nick a, nick a f- flab of skin down to the bone. Tankers, tankers had it hard. Tankers worked in the rendering vats, rendering rooms. And these uh, rooms were usually full of this putrid kind of steam. It's hot in there. And the tanks that they worked around were close to the ground. So a lot of times, I mean, these guys would trip and fall into one of these tanks. And by the time they're fished out, I mean, you can't even display the bodies. Half their face is melted off. Their eyeballs are out of the sockets. You don't know where they're at. Sometimes these guys wouldn't be found until end of day, and all you would have is just a skeleton. And at that point, you don't know which batch they were in. So they get shipped out into the world as lard. So in addition to cooking with river grease, you're usually cooking with human fat. 
people were cooking with human fat. They were fertilizing their lawns with human fat. They were spreading the margarine where they would butter with human fat. Glycerin, ammonia, gelatin, all of these byproducts of the rendering room very well and oftentimes were made with human parts. Canners, they would cut their hands on the tins very frequently and they would trade tins and they would often get blood poisoning. Picklers and salters, they, um, this is the one that gets me. The picklers had a very, very specific ailment. I mean, anyone can cut their hand and fall into a vat and die. Picklers, however, you had to work in the pickle room. They had something called pickled hands. And what pickled hands were was when you're handling this cold meat and you're dunking it into the brine water right over and over again. You just wash, rinse, repeat. Except you're not washing your hands, you're just dunking them in brine water. Well, after a while their hands become very, very red. They're very sore, they hurt, and they tense up, and their hands get red. And they would have these, I don't want to say sores, they're kind of like calluses, you know? Thick, red lumps on their hand, you know? It would get very, very hard, these red spots in their hands, and they would be raised off the flesh. And eventually they'd crack. These red sores, they would crack down to the bone. And their hand would be useless. And let's say you did cut your hand. You're dipping it in salt water every single day. You're putting salt on your wound. That's what gets me. All in all, a single plant could furnish food for up to 30 million people. 30 million people they would furnish food for, a single plant. And they were always working. People were always getting hurt, dying, losing parts of their body that would be sent out into the world as meat, hands ground up as ground beef, human fat mistaken as a lard. I mean, you name it, it happened. In the working conditions, either when you weren't getting hurt, they weren't anything to you know write home about. In the winter, it was cold. In the summer, it was hot, terribly hot. And flies would descend upon upon the plants. I mean, thousands, billions of flies. Maggots burrowing into the meat. Rancid meat was super common. I mean, the the meat was very poorly preserved. It was salted or barely refrigerated. And this is where it kind of comes to a head. I mean, the meat was so poorly preserved that during the Spanish-American War, whole battalions of soldiers were killed from dysentery and food poisoning because of the rancid meat. The exact numbers, they're hard to gauge because there were so many deaths from malaria and yellow fever, and yellow fever has many of the same symptoms as dysentery, with the profuse vomiting, bloody diarrhea, all the fun stuff. So, more soldiers probably died from consumption of spoiled Chicago meat than from bullets in combat in the war. I mean, it's a known fact that more soldiers died from disease in the Spanish-American War than from bullets in combat. But it's quite possible that more died from eating the spoiled meat than from bullets. If that doesn't go to show you how little attention was given to properly preserving food in this period, I don't know what will. I mean, and then the preserved quote, preserved food, was so heavily doctored with chemicals that those would often lead to new diseases. So either your meat was not preserved at all, and then you would die from dysentery or cholera that goes untreated in the battlefield, or you would get some crazy new disease, which is basically just poisoning, from these chemicals they would use to heavily doctor the meat. And this is common not just to meat. Many of the medicines people went to at pharmacies were concoctions of chemicals that would often cause new diseases. That was nothing new. Oftentimes when someone gets sick from cholera, they would go to the pharmacy to get some sort of medicine to help them. And it would, it would exacerbate the symptoms. People would get sicker from taking the medicine. So this becomes known as the United States Army Beef Scandal. The United States Army Beef Scandal. 
around this time, Charles Edward Russell writes The Greatest Trust in the World, where he talks about this uh, this beef trust. The beef trust. Mm. Essentially, the beef trust was there was a large conglomerate of a few, we'll liken them to robber barons, guys that owned all of the production. Just a few plants that owned all of the all of the meat production in America. This is similar to oil, the big banks. And these were all things that Teddy Roosevelt took on. He challenged trusts. That was kind of his shtick. So when we say the jungle gets in the hands of Teddy Roosevelt and he goes, oh my word, and he goes and changes the way we handle food in America with the Meat Inspection Act and the Clean Food and Drug Administration, the FDA... That has some truth in it, and that's what you're taught in school, but it has so much more. The greatest trust in the world has quite an effect on Teddy Roosevelt. He was on a crusade against the trusts, so he wanted to break the beef trust. He wanted to make sure the soldiers were not being killed by what was provided from the home front. So the army beef scandal has quite an effect on him. It's not just the jungle. It's an amalgamation of so many different things. I mean, in 1904, 50,000 packing house workers walked off the job in a single day. 50,000. If 25,000 is one-fifth of the population, two-fifths of Chicago basically just walked off a job in one single day. It wasn't just the jungle. There were so many other precipitating factors. So Teddy Roosevelt lobbies pretty heavily and successfully oversees the passing of the Meat Inspection Act and the Food and Drug Administration. And for anyone to say that, oh, Teddy Roosevelt cured it all. If you think the FDA and the Meat Inspection Act solved all of the meatpacking house problems, I think you're going to see how gross it gets. And if you think it's any better today than it was then, you really should tune in for the conclusion of the dirty history of slaughterhouses. I mean, that was a doozy. Who wouldn't want to listen to part three? Hey, it's everywhere. You know the deal. iTunes. I mean, Apple Podcasts. SoundCloud, Stitcher. Tune in. Our website YouTube, you want to play it, it's going to be on there, all right? And as always, if you like what you heard here, go subscribe. Subscribe on all those shits. Do it. Why wouldn't you? I mean, come on. Really? Artwork for the show is provided by Woodrow Cower. You can find him on Instagram at Woodrow Draws Pictures. Um, He has an Etsy. He's got all kinds of shit. Just go check him out. Give him your money if you can. I mean, he'll take it. Technical support and the Twitter and everything like that. All that good stuff. Video direction, YouTube. That's all run by Lucas Farrell. I'm Tommy Thompson. I do all the research. I'm the one talking to you in your eardrums. What else? What else do we have? Oh, yeah. Follow us on all the bullshit, you know? Get us there on Instagram, Twitter. Instagram at Tommy underscore Tombstones. Instagram at Tommy underscore Tombstones. You can follow us on Twitter at Pod Dirty, P-O-D-D-I-R-T-Y. That's where you get all the updates, fun facts. I'm posting shit every single day. There's always going to be new stuff. Dirty History doesn't stop on start on Tuesdays. It's posted every single day of the week. Just go check it out. We have a website, you know, with the footnotes if you don't believe me on any of this shit. What else? What else? Oh, I got a Tumblr, too. That's Dirty History Podcast. Um, I made a Facebook. I capitulated. The Facebook thing, I'm in. I'm on it. It's there. It's a good way to DM and talk. You can email me at dirtyhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Do all that shit. It'd be a good time. Let's build this, all right? Again, if you have any suggestions, please let me know. Come on. Email. DM. All that. Don't call me. I don't have my phone number up. You don't have to do that. Anyway, as Truman always says, what is it? Good day, good evening, and good night. I'll talk to you next week. I'm Tommy Thompson, and this 
has been Dirty History. Thank you.